Welcome, everybody, to another edition of Sip and Stories. My name is Tosi Baserga, Lifestyle Director at the Monarch Dunes Trilogy Club here in Napomo. And with me, I have a very special guest, the one, the only Rockin' Ted, as he's known to most people. But I swear he's got a last name. I haven't really investigated yet. I'm not sure if it's Rockin' or what, but Rockin' Ted? Well, you know, they just call me, they just call me uh, hashtag Bad Ted. <laughs> <laughs> bad Ted, I like that, I like that. Well, thank you for coming out. Uh, obviously, we should probably say where you work, but he works with Cass Wines. As you can see, we have a, a lot of beautiful products here with us. Uh, how are you doing so far today? Well, you know, we're doing good. We drove down, um, uh, and we're looking forward to this. We're doing a lot of virtual stuff now, so this is actually a very good setup, and we're really glad to be here, my friend. Yes, thank you. Well, the, the uh, Trilogy has really set us up with some amazing uh, software and hardware to be able to execute things like this. So uh, first things first, how's the winery doing? How are you guys doing out there? Well, you know, we're open now. Good. And, uh, you know, and we're in mass, but, you know, I, I got to share a really quick little story. So we've got this project that we've been working on for six years, uh, the uh, Geneseo Inn. Well, two months ago, I'm looking at my partner. We've been through six years of all the process. And I looked at him and I said, really mean we can't open? <laughs> really? Well, guess what? We're open now. And we're glad all our people, with no one, we didn't lay anybody off. We weathered it. If people are coming back. They're glad to be out. Amazing. The, the bistro down at the winery is doing well. Everybody's good. You know what's really great is I think that's a good sign of a strong infrastructure yes. when you have people who not only have confidence and faith in what you've built, but a desire to stick with. I mean, at those times, uncertainty can make people do some kind of crazy things. So. They, they really can. And even during the, the shutdown, we did a lot of takeout. We had people come and buy wine, cases of wine. Mm -hmm. Um, which we had great, we have great support. You know, I think that's really amazing. Not only is it on a lot of the businesses to be able to ensure that they provide support for their employees and that there's something there, but also the local community supporting people like yourselves. Because, you know, I don't want to buy my wine from Walmart or have Walmart make me a wine. I'm well, telling you. So. <laughs> and just another little sidebar, you know, right when the shutdown happened, we had a big wedding canceled. In fact, we had to cancel because we didn't want to get bad press. 180 people, we, we had purchased all the food. So what we did is we started preparing dinners for the winery people that were laid off. Amazing. So every Friday they could come to Cass Winery and pick up prepared dinners. And we'd do like 100. And then after that ran out, we just kept doing it for about six weeks. Wow. And we did it because we want to reach out and help our people. I'm telling you, something as small as just even a meal and do not have to cook a meal or do not worry about where your next meal is coming from can be so grounding and satisfying. Well, it's to know people care. Yeah, we're all in this together. And I think that's a really great way to approach it. Uh, so what was the first meal that you served them? Well, it was a, it was a wedding um, dinner. So we had uh, little uh, fillets. Oh, so the first meals were really good. I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> Should have had a donut tip jar out there or something like that. Well, good for them. But you know what? They probably deserve it. And I'm glad that they were able, that not only you provided it, but obviously it was well received. Well, and, and it, again, it, you know, this was nobody's fault. It just happened. So we all pulled. And I love the whole community pulled to guess, actually. I mean, I think that's one of the main things that we learned from this is how important our community is to each other. And it's how you say hi to someone. Where do you go and buy your bread? How do you act in certain social situations? I mean, there's so many things now that we're learning and that I can at least say I'm proud to be, you know, living in this area and proud to be working here. So. Well, I, and so are we. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know what I'd be proud to do too? Is to serve you a glass of wine. That's what I would be proud to do. So my friends, yeah. let us know a little bit about this first beautiful 2019 Viognier that we'll be trying. Well, what's you fun, already got a head yeah, start. What's, so what's fun about the Viognier guys is, you know, we have uh, 11 varietals planted in the vineyard. The Viognier is from day one has always been one of our rock stars. The uniqueness about this wine I can't do Sauvignon Blanc or uh, yeah. Pinot Gris, but this is my alternative. It's basically free run, meaning there's no press juice, and I call it the purest form. It's uh, It's got this stone fruit and minerality. Mm. Oh, man. And it's just, it's just fresh and bright. I think those are perfect ways to describe it. Oftentimes, Viognier's can seem cloying. And see, I'm like, I'm salivating right yeah. now. I can taste that city. 
And they can seem cloying and have that kind of uh, orange blossom or peach or just to be really upfront in your nose. Well, they, they over ripen it. People over and they, what do it can get oily and thick. Yeah, yeah. You know, this good. this is refreshing and it's been this way from day one. Yeah. So we're very pleased with this. You know, I always get really excited to find a wine that you can justify drinking during the day. And I find that this could potentially be one of those wines. You know, I like you, brother. You can look right in. <laughs> if you bring the wine, I'll come and I'll compliment you all day, my friend. Well, awesome. I, obviously, we could talk about this wine all day. Day, but part of sipping stories is not only understanding the, what's in the bottle, but who's behind the bottles and who makes it. So, first, where the heck are you from? Well, you let's know, talk. Where, yeah, where, where, where's a rock and Ted created? You know, where's that born and bred? Well, Paso you know? Robles, California. Oh, there it is, local boy. But but I want to talk about the label of Cass because Cass, uh, as we get into these wines, you're gonna. There's a reason why they're how they are. Um, I grew up in Paso Robles, been a building, builder there for almost 40 years now, building high-end estates and wineries, but never dreamt that 20 years ago I would meet a gentleman and be a part owner in a winery. But the, the, the basis of Cass is we went to South Africa in 2003 after purchasing a barrel of South African wine at Hospice de Rhone in August of 2002. Oh, my gosh. Hospice Fabulous. de Rhone, we're thinking about you, right? Fabulous now. wine. Yeah. Drank it, got a hold of the winemaker, and with Charles Back, Fairview Winery, Parle, South Africa. And we were his guests in January of 03. Wow. Went over for a month, played golf in the morning, drank wine, standing in 17th century Dutch buildings, wineries with these vats in the ground that they're still using from all of those years. And I kept hearing Old World. And Old World translated to me vineyard driven wines. Now, growing up in Paso Robles, there's not a lot of vineyard-driven wines there. There's a lot of ripeness and a lot of oak, yes. and they're big wines. Doesn't mean it's bad. No. It just means that that's what they do. Well, it, that last night, last week, we're in, we're in Stalabosch, where he says, my partner says we were drinking Syrah. No, we were ripped. <laughs> and I go, partner, let's open a winery. <laughs> the birth of Cass. You know, when you're enjoying a big bottle and those ideas you have, are always the best ones. Well, right? you know? and, uh, and on the serious <laughs> note, we brought back a South African winemaker and Lewin State was with us for the first 10 years and Lewin and I set the style and these wines were gonna be made in the vineyard and truly Sterling has kept that tradition going. So like this Viognier, it's, it's crisp, it's fresh. One of the main things is we've become really good farmers because mm. wine is truly made in the vineyard. Yes. We use Sterling when there's a problem. And believe me, he says there's always lots of problems, <laughs> but I go get over it, Sterling. Yeah. <laughs> well, you can't make a good wine with bad grapes. I mean, that's... Well, yeah, you know, and so essentially all the wines that were, you taste at Cass are going to be a, really a representation of the varietal and what the vineyard did that year because they're different each year. So what about South Africa? Because obviously there's a lot of things with it. You're saying it's old world. You know, sometimes they say the practices are a little outdated or maybe not the most clean or hygienic. But what about that area really resonated with you and kind of inspired in that sense because well, South Africa wouldn't be maybe the number one spot maybe oh I went to France well I didn't even know what, what I was getting into but what I loved is that they, they had that blood red dirt and mm. of course I can taste the South African wine without even taste I can smell it but again it's that farming that they did and how they let the farming dictate what they that's what sort of inspired me and Steve got the same inspiration that's amazing that's amazing. And, you know, it's nice that taking it back to its roots, everybody can buy the most fancy equipment, the biggest buildings and industries. But like we were saying, if you can't ripen a grape, if you can't grow it correctly, I'll give you a moment. And there's a thing called weather. Because, mm. you know, you can do everything you can to grow the best grape, to take care of your vines. But then the weather shows up and we don't know what it's going to do. You know, you can do things like we did. We got frost protection because we can irrigate the whole vineyard and encapsulate an ice so it helps us. But there's, at Barry said, I mean, at flowering, the wind comes up, it can shatter the vine. I mean, there's things that, I remember in 2013, Steve and I are sitting on the porch and this is late May and it's 105 degrees and there's a hot wind blowing. And I walked into the library, got a reserve. I said, pardon, we need to open this up because I think we just lost half of our crop to shatter but that's how that's farming well you know it's funny because that's it's all about working with the land and, and i think it's a humbling experience recognizing that you are not in control of everything you can have all the frost protection you can shoot 
sound waves into the sky and burst up clouds and everything like that. But in the end, it's about Mother Nature and how you adapt to it. And hopefully she's kind. Uh, sometimes she may and not be. But the majority yeah. of the time she is. Yeah. You know, there's a year, 2011, I think people might remember how cold it was. In fact, my whole life's geared on weather, guys. So <laughs> every year I look, I can go back to eight, nine. But we had a very cold, that was the last wet year before the uh, drought. But we had a very cold growing season. A lot of Sonoma Coast never picked their fruit because of a bunch rock. Well, it, we had the weather of France. Well, guess what happened? We learned better how to farm. We went in, picked, did uh, uh, kind of canopy management like four times. We got ripe. Most people didn't get ripe. Well, some of the best wines we ever made. Of course, I love French wines. Mm. And our wines are old, more old world French style out of Paso Robles. And now we're getting our Cabernets at the 13-4 alcohol which is rare for Paso Robles. Which, thank you, because <laughs> I swear, I call them cocktail wines. When they hit 15.7, it's like, ugh. I call them a cheap date wine. No, no, no. Yeah. There you go. You know, we all got our different ways to talk about them. But it, it almost lacks that food-friendly ability. It lacks that acidity yes. that makes it really necessary. Now, obviously, hearing you speak, South Africa was huge for you. It yes. was, it was um, you know, not only chain, inspired you with the wine making, but it almost changed your career, per se. Now, was there anyone who has influenced you within your journey in the wine industry? Someone who gave you a life lesson, someone who was able to kind of steer you in the right direction. Obviously you have a very good core team around you, but maybe in other random practices or opportunities, was there someone else who really, you know, inspired you or mentored you? Well, there really was. And there's a guy named Jim Smoot. Hmm. Jim Smoot is no longer with us, but he's the godfather of the plantings in Paso Robles. He started putting in the high end vineyards in 1979, I met him in the early 80s. And this man, and, and anybody in Paso Robles will know his name. And he would put the vineyard in, I'd build the estate, put the vineyard. So even before I even thought about having a vineyard, he introduced me to quality wine. Wow. So I knew, and, and the man is, is an, an icon of Paso Robles. And you know what? I really appreciate that because I think people like him, his legacy needs to move on and yes. continue on. And yes. that at times it can kind of become lost, you know, where there's so much happening and changing every day in Paso. Um, I think it's important to understand your roots, no pun intended, uh, before <laughs> moving forward. You like that, right? <laughs> and I guess one last thing, because our glasses are getting low, but, you know, you talk a lot about you try to prepare, all of a sudden something happens in the field, something happens in the winery. What was one of the most unexpected things for you when starting a career? Maybe having South Africa jump out or maybe turning from a builder to a wine you know, owner was a big thing. But what is there anything else that kind of you know, had a huge impact on you and changed your course of your career in a sense? Well, I think it was the fact that we, when we first started, of course, this was 05 was our first vintage that we released. You know, you have a wine in your bag. You're, I'm in Washington, D.C., with going my first trip and I go, I have a Viognier and a Cabernet and I'm walking down the row and I see $9, $8. Well, my Viognier 17 and my Cabernet 42. <laughs> so I'm going, uh-oh. Well, guess what happened? I sold both of them to this old crotchety uh, Washington DC liquor store owner. And I, I walked out of that store going, I can do this. Wow. It changed, it changed me. Wow, that's amazing. And that's really cool to also understand that a part of your personality can can affect, I mean, obviously sales is more than just a personality, but just having that one interaction, that one opportunity can really change the course. And it's pretty awesome that you were able to take advantage of that. Well, thank you, brother. Yeah. Cause you know, you don't know if you're gonna sell a bottle. Yeah. You know? And back in the day when we were making four or 5,000 cases, I used to say, we, we sell every bottle that we don't drink. <laughs> well, now we're making like, 18,000 cases, and I can't say that. Do I need to be worried about you? Do I need to call somebody to get some support, get a, get a watch person for you? But, well, and, and, you know, it's great also to know, you know, that it doesn't all happen easily, that there is a grind that is occurring, that there is um, not only understanding the farm, understanding your production, but also understanding your marketing and how do you bring something. We were talking before when we said, you know, a wine's pretty much worthless unless someone's willing to pay for it. You know? Exactly. I mean, and, and having wines at that higher level could be. Well, and we're not the cheap, you know, we'd ever started at the low price point, you know, so again, it's been a process, yeah. my friend. Well, and I think it also speaks to ethos because if you start at a low price point, you're focusing on price point rather than quality and you're not probably as inspired to see all these little details I can set you above. I'm gonna stop talking, I'm gonna open up another bottle of wine. I think, I think that's we got a rosé coming We down. do have a rosé. So this beautiful 2018 Oasis rosé, uh, pre pre predominantly Grenache, uh, a little bit Moved in here. 
or is this this is all Grenache actually? Well, it's uh, Grenache, Mauvais, and, 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 and a hint, hint, hint of straw. This is more of a GSM, but primarily Grenache. And you know, guys, I know that rosé has become very popular. Um, I remember in the early years, you'd see a little thing like this in the store, be a little square, but now there's a row of it. <laughs> and people drink rosé year round. Oh yeah, absolutely. My wife, I can attest to that. I get a lot of influence from our rosé program from France. I love to go into south of France and uh, Van Dahl, of course, mm. as we talk, cheers. Yes, yeah, cheers. cheers. So notice the color. Well, there's a couple of ways up to 2016, we made a rosé called a saigné. Saigné is a French word for a bleed, meaning you bleed off of a big red and then you put into a tank and make rosé. So for instance, this, this wine, Grenache, we would grow a grape to make a Grenache, to stem it, put it into a fermentation tank and chill it to go in the cold soaking, but we would do a saigné, a bleed. Well, the problem with that method is you're basing your rosé on a grape you're growing to make a red wine. Color, acidity, ripeness. Well, like it begins in the farm. It begins in the yeah. vineyard. Well, it's Sterling and I and started. Let's purposely pick this fruit and make the fruit just for the rosé. So now we can control the ripeness, the color, the acidity, everything about it. So we're getting these wonderful Provence-style rosés, and I and, and we're the, like this year, and then the year that we've are released now is some of the best we've ever made. Which is amazing. And, and it's really nice to know that it's rooted in tradition and inspiration rather than trends and what's hot or selling. Um, because I think oftentimes you lose your soul and your ethos when you're trying to produce something that you don't really understand or care about. Exactly. Uh, and I think that, again, rosé is now we can drink it year round. Yeah. People do. Yeah. Well, plus we have such beautiful weather here, you know, yeah, rosé <laughs> lends itself uh, to, in that sense. Uh, this rosé is actually available by the glass at Adelina's Bistro, which is doing uh, dinner service. So come on in 5 p.m. to 9 p.m., Wednesday to Sunday. Highly recommend it. Noe or Jonathan will definitely recommend this bottle to you. Really, really great. Um, so I'd like to comment on the name because oh, I, yes, please. I named this uh, many years ago. And if you look at the label, there's a little palm tree, but it's called Oasis. Because we had a vision years ago that we were going to make Cass an oasis in the wilderness. So as we talk through tonight, you're going to find out sort of what has happened since. But truly, we are an oasis. We're 10 miles from nowhere. And well, so understanding oasis is, it's where is this oasis? So I believe you're in Paso somewhere. We are. So really, one of the things at least that I, I have found, you know, in creating wine lists or understanding wine is that Paso has so many beautiful AVAs in, in different sections and areas, but we kind of lump it all together. So I'm kind of, I'm looking to you to help guide me, to help explain a few things, all right? So when you think of Paso, how would you describe Paso just as an umbrella as a whole? What and would you say Paso? I would, first of all, it's huge. <laughs> in, terms of the, in terms of the AVA, yeah, it's huge. It's We're about twice, three times as big as bigger than Napa. Yeah. Um, and there's such diversity in the, in the AVA, you've got over by the coast, the west side being more influenced with the ocean, even though we get some of that, different soils, different terrain, different, uh, uh, as you move across the Salinas River and Paso Robles, you move onto the east side, we're a little more rolling open, more uh, different soil, more alluvial limestone, it's an old ocean bottom. Okay. Um, and we deal with the basic thing about Paso that makes it special is we'll be 95 to 100 during the day, but we're all, pretty much all of us are 40, 45 at night. So the acids and sugars are building all day and then they, they take a break. And that's where you get the complexity in the wines. And it's so important because you can extend that growing season. You can allow for more polyphenols to develop within the skin, oh. but not have the acidity over or the sugars get out of balance. Well, then you have to I mean, all the acid adjustments you have oh. to do. Well, once you get to that point, to me, it's like almost like not, not wine anymore, yeah. but it's like a winemaker's job is to pull the tewa out of the grape and where it's from, not to have its influence. That's why I see brewers as kind of, they create something rather than yes. poke something out. But and you know, what's really unique it. about the cast property, uh, it's the, we're in the heart of the Genesee. In fact, Genesee yes. Road runs right by our property. Um, there's a Wera Wera Creek there. It's like a real dry creek bed that drains into the Sneeze River. Well, if you go out and dig down, there's water running under the sand about two foot down even wow. now. Wow. So we get two or three degrees cooler. These breezes come up into the vineyard 
uh, the, the temperatures. So we can actually, during harvest, we get a little extra hang time if we choose. Wow. And again, one or two degrees makes a big difference. Huge. And you know, for me, I always, you know, I appreciated talking to you a little bit before because, you know, when we were talking east and west, one of my thoughts was temperature being the biggest difference in that, you know, west cooler, you know, you can have a longer hang time, east hotter, higher alcohol, you know, a little bit more juicy, jammy, raisinated. Um, but you were speaking more in differences east and west of soil differences that you highlighted uh, briefly and uh, water availability. Well, water's I mean, see, I, king. I, and well, growing up in Paso, I, I saw the east side west thing all happen and it's sort of a non issue any longer. But we are sitting on the Creston Aquifer, which is one of the biggest aquifers in Northern America. You can drill a well anywhere out on the east side pretty much and hit water. Uh, west side, of course being uh you sometimes you'll drill one ranch that i'm working on right now he drilled 11 wells and never hit water so water's king but in the early years the growers market in the 80s east side guys could do eight nine ten tons an acre not that we would ever do there's that, a lot <laughs> but they could yeah so guess what inferior they weren't the best grade well then producers like cass and stillwater and chateau margine Pomar Junction, all these people started farming the land in balance. This is what we work on. And guess what's happening? You know, some of the highest, the best fruit in the whole, is coming out of the east side. In fact, we sell around 300 tons of fruit to the west side. Again, it's Paso Robles. Yes. It's now Paso Robles. And, 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 and which is great because it's nice to know that there's at least a little teamwork involved. But one of the things that I guess was one of the biggest realizations for myself is that there's so much to discover on the east side. And I really, you know, want all of you to be motivated to go check out the east side of Paso. There's so many different AVAs, and right now the Geneseo one is where Cass is located. Yes. So I'm sure half of the people have never heard of it. I had to ask, am I pronouncing this right? Uh, so thank you for your guidance. <laughs> but um, educate us a little bit. Let us know what, what, I mean, why does it matter? You know, Paso's Paso, who cares, you know? What's special about this little area all the way on the east side? I gotta drive that far to go out there? Well, first of all, you, you don't drive that far to come to Cass for lunch, because <laughs> lunch is fabulous. <laughs> Fair In fact, Steve and I were the first, uh, this was 2008, we're the first winery to have prepared food with That's chefs. Cool. Uh, Thank you. That's and so by the way, it, it, they tried to take it away from us when we did an annex building. But why wouldn't you want to feed people when you're 10 miles out in the middle of nowhere? A, you can make money and you kind of need to eat when you're drinking. But I truly, guys, the farther you get, see, there's this thing called the Templeton Gap, which is right at York Mountain. It's a funnel where this beautiful cold air comes in every afternoon from the Pacific Ocean. The farther you get away from it, the less you get. But we're right in the path of the end of it. And the Creston District is another unique district that's right there also. So we get that little, again, it only takes one or two degrees to make a big difference. So does that air and that wind coming in, what is the biggest impact? Is it because the temperature difference? Is it because it helps, you know, powdery mildews or keeps air going through? No, the what it does, it, does just, it? it just keep, that's the sugars and the ripeness sort of back off. So we're able to hang longer okay. and get more complexity. That's amazing. And, and again, it's all about that balance. I, I swear, October, November must be the most nerve-wracking time for you. Just kind of figuring oh, out. I got it, stories, bro. <laughs> <laughs> well, we don't got that kind of time. I know, today, I know. Right? I know. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, I mean, obviously, everything that we're drinking here, and I appreciate understanding a little bit more, and it's almost seemingly like Rome varietals are working very well out there in East Paso. I mean, we're drinking Viognier, you know, we're having a Grenache with some Syrah, and your next one has Moved for the 19, which will hopefully be coming soon. Um, so it seems like a lot of Rome varietals. Well, they are, and they do well, but, you know, Paso, it, it, Cab's King, you know, it, we have 145 acres planted, and 85 of that is Cabernet, for four, four clones of Cabernet. They do fabulous. But the Rhones, really, I'm a Rhone Ranger at heart. And uh, in fact, these two wines right here are, even this is a Bordeaux, but it's got Movedra. So the Ted wines are sort of showing that. But um, the Rhones do so well. Like I couldn't grow Chardonnay if I tried to, but the Viognier, Roussan, and the Marsan do fabulous. Uh, it's just, they just do well. Yeah. And when it's nice because, you know, obviously when it comes to American wines, we kind of have 
made it as an easy guide. It is Pinot, it is Chardonnay, it is Cab. And Merlot. And Merlot. <laughs> and so, but if you go out to Europe, it's a little bit different how they do it. And it's really nice to see those selection of varietals giving their place. Um, it's They're popular, but it almost it's almost like you got to seek them out. Well, think about it. I, I do a lot of events where we do it, festivals and people come to the table. I like a cab, please. Well, <laughs> you know, I got a cab over here, but here, what I'm going to do, I'm going to get to take your ticket, um, but I'm going to give you a Grenache, and if you don't like it, you can have your ticket back. Well, guess what? We're going to do Rhone 101, and now all these years, people are understanding that there's so much more to wine than just Cabernet Merlot and Chardonnay. Well, I mean, someone in your position, it's not only being passionate about what you're doing, maybe having a small fortune to be able to, you know, <laughs> to do this, but but it's about communicating. It's about explaining. It's about having people understand what you're trying to do. It's almost like an artist where you could do something very abstract. And just because someone's not either comfortable with the medium, comfortable with what you're doing, it's almost your role and responsibility to let your mind and, and connect. And yes, sort of sense and, and, and people are, it, get uncomfortable about wine because they think they don't know anything. Well, what I tell people, you know everything. If it's good to you, it's good <laughs> wine. You know what I mean? But people get intimidated by so all much. the stuff that they do about wine. One of my yeah. mentors, you know, one of the things he told me was like, wine is the most complex scientific beverage that you'll ever experience in your life, or it's fermented grape juice. And you got to talk to everybody. It's just community. grape juice. It's grape juice. And it sat out for a while, got some bubbles, got some booze in it, and now we're drinking it. But it's, it's, it's incredible how, you know, and, and, and it's hard when someone's so passionate about something to kind of take a step back and realize that maybe not everyone is as passionate as yourself. Exactly. And how do you still make that product valuable to them and explain how, how they can use it, especially something they've never used before? Well, like I tell people at the taste room, just you can always dump it out. <laughs> no, don't. <laughs> always, always take an opportunity to taste it because you'll be surprised. And I try to taste every wine that is offered to me because you know what? You might find some really incredible wines. I'd agree with you. And what I love about wine is that there's so many layers underneath it. It's not. Sorry, took me a That's really good. Uh, but it's not only about you know just if it could not the weather, the geography, the soil. The there's so many factors that go into it that can influence it that you actually learn about a person. You learn about an area. You learn about. And so it's really amazing that you're showcasing the Geneseo district the way you are. What would you say, though, is one of the biggest misconceptions that people would have of the area? Is it me thinking everything's hot and going to be 15%? Well, or what, what would you say the biggest that's misconception? That's exactly it. What I would say the big, would be that from the lingering in the 80s where they produce so many tons per acre mm -hmm. is that they, these are – it's so hot during the day, but what people don't understand is 40 degrees at night. But also what we're doing now is we're cropping back. We're cutting the – we like four tons an acre. We could do that Grenache we're going to have next could do eight tons, but we, we, we've learned balance because this is such a prolific region. If I cut my crop back to two tons an acre, it would be vegetative. So I've, I've spent 20 years trying to find the balance and we're there. Of course we alter it year, but you know, because of the weather and the, of course, remember the drought years. Now that was a whole learning experience. So I got a, a bunch of stories about well, that. Well, I wow. say I don't really envy the, the life of a, you know, I feel like my members keep me on my toes a lot, but I can only imagine, you know, uh, Mother Nature, Mother Earth kind of keeping you on your toes. Well, my vineyard time. almost shut down in 13 because of the water. You know, one quick thing about water in, in the Paso region, you know, our water's reactive to the basin. So as it's sitting down in the ground, it's, it's, it's taking up the nutrient and the salt and the minerality. So when we irrigate, we're dumping that around the root zone, and it will eventually create this limestone layer that will block up the, the intake of nutrient. Now that's what makes Paso Paso, but in those years when it didn't, we didn't get fresh water, it almost shut our vineyard down. So we did an acid injection system where we adjusted the pH so now we can survive on our water, even though rain is the best thing we can get to flush it all out. It's kind of funny too, did you ever think you'd be learning about all this sort of stuff? No. <laughs> I'm an old carpenter for that. I was going to say, you're trying to sound like an amateur scientist right now. Or you're not trying to be a scientist. It's like, hey, you, you, you build stuff. You don't, you're not doing that. But no, and, and, and that's uh, really amazing. And, um, and I guess one of my last questions, and, you know, understanding your background, especially, you know, all the time you spend in South Africa, I'm not saying that the grapes that are grown there are necessarily the same that you'd find in the Genesee District, but 
your affinity for roan varietals was that more based off what the land offered you or something that you found yourself motivated by and that you were trying to create or allow pasta to have well i I think that the history of the roans are doing so well but our vineyard manager that we first worked with to put the vineyard steve and, and john crossland he really was instrumental in us planting those rones. And one of the unique things about Cass is we were the first vineyard that planted the first on top certified clones. Yeah. That's a big word. I can't pronounce it any longer. <laughs> I forgot how to do that. But a couple, just a couple of brief things about that. 1999, they first came into the country, seven year program where they weeded out ones that ripened sooner or later. But also the most important thing was we knew what we had. A lot of cuttings came over in suitcases in the early years. They thought they had Viognier, turned out to be Marcel. Wow. Well, we know what our clones are, and they're pure. So, of course, we paid 50 cents a vine more back then, and that hurt, bro, hurt. <laughs> I'm sure present you is thanking past you for making that sort of decision and, and taking that leap of faith. Well, every berry on that ranch is either used by us or sold. That's so we're blessed. No, and that's amazing. And I think part of what you have is not only an opportunity, to produce amazing fruit, to get creative, to produce all these wines, but also responsibility. Responsibility to treat the earth properly. A responsibility to not overuse your resources like water. A responsibility to ensure that the product you're actually creating is something that represents an area and represents something bigger than yourselves. Exactly. I mean, yeah, we're, we're taking care of our land. Yes. We, uh, we have 70 owl boxes on the ranch and we raise owls and we use no pesticides at all. And we have probably a hundred owls a year that we raise on the ranch. When you drive around the ranch at night, they're everywhere. Oh yeah. And it's wonderful. The wine must be good based on the conversation that we're going in. There we go. You know, when we start talking about owls and everything like that, you know, it's been a good day so far. So right here, and I'm going to make sure I uh, describe this one properly. We are enjoying the 2018 Grenache. Now I was told, I was told that this is one of your favorite wines and it was very small production. So I was like, I want it. Um, but <laughs> I'm very excited to understand as to why. Oh, God, look at that color already. This is a truly, uh, Sorry, this will be a right representation of exactly what Cass is all about. Amazing. This will be the basis of why we're who we are. That's great. Um, so a lot of Grenache in, in, in planted in Brown Cali- in California is mm. way darker than Cheers. Cheers. Thank you. I appreciate the eyes. It's, it's important. God, that is beautiful. Isn't it? Sorry. I just hate having these glasses because I got a big nose, so I like to like <laughs> really get it in there. And these glasses are kind of like a buffer for me, so it's nice well, right well, now. Well, look at so. the color. No, it's, 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 it's like a, a see through. It's, 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 it's like a Pinot, if yeah. you will. Yeah. yeah. You know? Well, and it has this like twang of, um, I don't want to say like brick, or oxide, but it's like getting that orange well, sort of. Well, it's a characteristic, but, but a lot of people don't know this because they most people put 2% Syrah or Petit for the color. They're afraid it. to let it be this yeah. beautiful wine. And, and let it be what it is. Yeah, because you know, when I pick a bunch of, of Grenache in the vineyard, and my vines are 20 years old now, I hold it up to the sun and I can see the sun through the grape. It's a lighter yeah. grape. But I could distort this with 2% raw and you'd take away that candy strawberry that's yeah, on it. Yeah. Of course, this is on very neutral oak. There's not a new barrel at all. I like to tell people that this is strictly my vineyard in a glass, truly. That's a pretty big uh, for a wine, you know? That's, oh. I mean, sorry, that's well, really. And what's fun about this year, mm. it's actually bigger than last year. Is it? Because again, I can't control the influences of, of the vineyard. But to me, it's like, these are the type of wines that, you know, I, I spent a lot of time setting the old world wines and, and having my palate that way. My grandfather was Argentinian, so he had a whole cellar of Italian wines from whenever. But the fact that you can have something so light and just kind of almost like dance on the tongue, but yet have a full flavor and that lingers because you, you, you want that flavor. When you're tasting wine, you don't want a wine to come in and come out, 10 seconds, flavor's gone, you know? Maybe if you're not trying to think about it or it's a wine that you don't really want to taste, okay, yeah. that works. But a wine that you want to taste, you look for that finish, you look for that lingering sort of flavor. Just like you said, you can feel it almost all the way down and it's just a really well-balanced expression of Grenache. Uh, from well, and you know, in 2004, when we made the first one, People thought we were crazy, but this is the wine <laughs> style that I, I said it. Counts. I'm glad you're crazy. So I'm but glad they you thought we were. Yeah. You're going to make a that color of a wine, red wine from Paso Robles. Well, 
yeah, we're farmers and this is what the vineyard gave us. Well, guess what? Truly, this is a rock star for us. Well, and what? And sorry to cut you off. Yeah, no, don't you worry. Uh, welcome to my show. I, I, <laughs> yeah, I, I cut you off. Got me off. Yeah, yeah, but what you almost you almost hit the, the 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 core of what we're talking about when people say this is a Paso wine. No, this isn't a Paso wine. Geneseo wine. Yeah, Geneseo, and this and is that's it. what like where for us to to continue our development, our understanding of what's available to us is that we put it under this big umbrella and we create our certain expectations of what we're going to be getting. Where it's like, no, truly understand the area, truly understand the grapes that are being produced there, and and understand that different expressions of the same grape. We get so hooked on just one grape, it's like, well, man, it's land, it's where it's made. I mean, exactly. And if people will allow that to play, but what there's the thing called manipulation, where you want to take this beautiful wine, well, I want to make it darker, <laughs> and I want to make it bigger. Well, guess what? You've just taken your farming. It didn't matter. And exactly. this is what CAS exactly. is all about. We're going to exactly. let the farming dictate what exactly. we do. I, I think you couldn't have said it better because, again, it's what is your ethos and what is the intent of what you're trying to do with these wines? Are you trying to showcase the land and have something that's beautiful that goes with food that is it can be manipulated in a bunch of different ways? Or do you want to control because based off what people's taste yeah. profile is? Yeah, I know. And that always changes. And I feel like if you do that, it's a very short-sighted yeah. approach to wine. This you wine know? has been this the Classic. same every year. We made it since 04. And some it, and some years are different. Hmm. And it, But it's just fun to see it. I can't wait. I'm tasting the new one in barrel right now, and it's oh. delicious. Oh, my gosh. Better but, than this? Well, it's just delicious. Okay. <laughs> That's like your kids. You can't pick the best one. I appreciate your diplomacy, my friend. Rock and Ted has a, has a softer diplomatic spot into him. I appreciate that. So, okay. You can make wine. We've seen you make some decent wine. All right. We, we've come to that, uh, you know, that realization. But I hear you also branching out in hospitality. Oh, we are. No, oh, God. Here we go. <laughs> Rock and Ted hospitality. I wow. appreciate it. Watch so. out for Cass. <laughs> <laughs> so, I guess really when we break it down we talk we've been talking a lot about a core things about wine of not necessarily it's part of what's in the wine but when and how to experience the wine and how best to express it is there a connection between hospitality and wine oh it's I mean, it's incredible so so think of where we are we started this winery in the winery actually in 2005 but we planted the vineyard in 2000 but we're on the east side we had to figure out a way to get people to come out to us we decided we were going to hook good wine with great hospitality. First winery that had prepared food. Now, guess what happened? We built this little B&B &B and an event center. Of course, my partner comes to me six years and goes, I want to build a, a barrel room event center and with a B&B. &B. And I go, really, partner? <laughs> <laughs> like we don't got enough. Because I knew that I'd have to build the darn thing. <laughs> <Yes>. Really? <laughs> so we've spent six years designing, going through the, I had to train the county on what B&B, &B, what containers were, because mm. this B&B &B, guys is an eight room container. You're, you're raised up in there, you park under them and you overlook my vineyard. And um, we have the breakfast is to die for which you had last week. I was gonna say, truth be told, uh, for my wife's anniversary, we decided, hey, Let's go out to the Geneseo and let's go out to the Geneseo Inn. Um, it was really a very unique experience. Um, obviously, when you walk up and you see a bunch of shipping containers, you're like, oh, you're putting me in the shipping container. <laughs> Thanks. I appreciate that. That's so thoughtful of you. Um, but once you actually get in there and start to see all the thoughtfulness and everything of how it's created, one of the best spots that my wife and I, we were enjoying a bottle of wine outside. I know, weird. But um, one of the things that we mentioned was you were in the vineyard. You heard the wind, you heard the birds, and you heard each other. And although Napomo can be so crazy, it was really nice to be able to get away and to be able to disconnect and to be able to really feel like you were in the midst of it all and, and, and have a different level of understanding. Obviously, we have a baby, so we can go walk and do all the other things, fun things you have there. But it was just a very intelligent and well-thought-out way to create something like that. So... I mean, A, what made you want to do that? And B, what, why did you put it there? And why did you choose shipping? Well, you know, whole, well, so many questions. Well, and part of that's my partner, but there's a place down in, in, in uh, Ensenada that, that they built a lot of these out of containers. That was our inspiration. Okay, okay. And nothing, no one's ever done that here. So we thought, what the heck? Let's do it. 
You so, did it before we did after South Africa. And I have a I have a life now because I, that was in my mind a lot of that. So now that it's finished, I can move because you know when I build a, a big home for somebody, I have a plan. Well, that plan was in my head. So uh, thank God I have a life now. <laughs> and you know we did it. We put it where it was because truly what we wanted to do is create an environment about the vineyard. People come to wine country to be in the vineyard. So as we cleared the land to build it, now we're bringing the vines all back in. As you saw, we have the newly planted vines. Yeah. And you're gonna, I raised them up in the air, you park under them, because I wanted you to sit and overlook the vineyard. So the goal is to be in the vineyard. It's amazing. And it also provided an opportunity for my wife and I to do bets on if the hawk was going to get whatever it was searching for. Oh, golly. So that was pretty fun, too. Welcome so. to the ranch, bro. Yeah. I was, it's a different, you, you get to see the nitty gritty. You get yeah. to see the real life behind it all, which is really, really um, nice. So obviously we're talking experiences and we'll, we'll talk about the end a little bit more, but for you, what makes a tasting experience? Cause you obviously have a tasting room there and you have the inn. and what makes a hospitality difference? What commonalities are there and what differences are there in which you're trying to, in a sense, almost cater to two different crowds yet under one umbrella of cats. And I, I, that's a great question because what Steve and I learned in South Africa when we were there is rarely do you stand at a bar. You, they seated us at a table and they brought the flights of wine out and we really liked that. So we were the, one of the first wineries that rarely do you stand at a bar. Have you ever been at a tasting bar that's crowded? You feel like you're in the way. <laughs> So what we do in the way or you're not allowed to, that's enter, what I mean. And you need to, so we sit awkward. people so, and we've always brought the wine to you. So that started that hospitality thing with the tasting. And then we of course introduced food, which took it to another level. And of course I'm really new at this innkeeper thing. <laughs> so, so I'm working, I'm working on it, brother. You're doing a good job, man. You're doing You're areas of improvement. No, you're doing awesome. Man. You're, it's really fun to see because people like, yourself almost don't take those risks well you know wine i mean taste, it, it's, it's we it's an experience yeah agreed. and most people we don't want a corporate quick pour and you go to the next people come to cast and they stay all afternoon it's because true. of the experience and that's what's that's what's cool and and there's nothing worse to you know I appreciate that because the ethos behind the experience and when someone has either those gauge pours or it's like a one ounce pour. They scare the hell out of me because I'm oh, thinking it's wow. not going to work and then I'm going to get in trouble. <laughs> I'm more just like I want to poke a hole in that thing and just say let it, let it flow, those man. Let those will never be a cast. Okay. <laughs> Ever. Thank you. We just, the whole thing is just to let you know there's no uh, pre poured uh, Well, they call me four test. ounce Clemens. Okay. It's a bad ten. Bad, <laughs> bad ten. <laughs> well, that's, that's amazing. And so... Um, the inn that you have there, obviously there's a lot of thoughtfulness behind it, whether it's the placement in the vineyards and trying to what you're incorporating. Um, I guess from, cause of my background, I worked at Four Seasons for, you know, eight, eight ten years. Um, what hospitable elements or what, what were you trying to showcase of cast to people who are staying there versus people who are just going to do a quick kind of drive by taste and whatnot? What is there more to learn about cast that people who stay there have an opportunity to understand. Well, the wonderful thing is we're working on trying to make us, our staff and every, all the people in place are like, we're not even there. We want people to just experience the ranch themselves. And we're learning on how to be invisible, mm. but also have impeccable service. Yes. But two things have happened to get the permit to do this, which we were very fortunate that we got eight units. They gave us everything we asked for, by the way. What? what? Is you get, to, <laughs> you get to participate in ranch activities. We had to create. So we have uh, we have uh, beekeeping where you can involve, get involved in that. We have, really? you can get involved in the gardening. We're going to do a harvest involvement where you can come and participate, stay at the end and get involved in harvest. So cool. uh, we also have a, a olive orchard that we plant. So we're going to start pressing olive oil and we're going to have people get involved with that now i do raise all the beef on the ranch that we serve at the restaurants but no one's signed up to help me harvest a cow yet I'll be, I'll but be it's all i mean i want someone to sign up with me you know and we'll hose you down when we're done and we'll get it all it's all good sign up this will be available uh online after this so if you want to go uh, get a little dirty with rock and ted you know what i mean and then i'm not guaranteeing anything i'm just saying <laughs> we, we've got this beautiful company central coast trail rides that offers we do horseback riding on the ranch and there's a two you can go down in the river or you can go up on our properties and overlook and i've done it twice now and it's beautiful 
Was it tough? You know, obviously you're a very passionate man with um, some strong opinions about how you, uh, you know, are able to move forward. How is it finding a partner that will maintain the level of hospitality that you're doing, that you find to be a fit with what you're trying to create at the winery? How do you find these hosp hospitality partners? Well, is it just location or is it? I, I mean, think a location, but also we like their passion. That's amazing. You know, and we're, we're sort of, we got, we got, a, we got Halter, uh, we got Hunter Ranch sort of working with us to mm, do some awesome golf stuff hooked with it. There's a lot of wonderful things happening. And uh, we, we're, we're, creating the, we're creating the space for it. And it's amazing that not only did you get an opportunity for your, you know, your employees to be able to enjoy what you do, but also you're strengthening, strengthening your community. Yes. The more people that you involve, the more different you know, outlets, it strengthens everyone's business. Everyone brings in more business, and it creates a stronger name for the area and for what you're well, doing. Well, I mean, think about it. There's some really wonderful wineries all around us. The whole region is fabulous. And, and, I, and nine of them out of ten all are about Pastor Robles. We're all in this together. That's amazing. I don't care how much money you got. Everybody offers something, and that's what it's about. Nice. So pretend they're not here. Everyone plays along in the sandbox nicely and pass it. Actually, I mean, we do. They, you know, that's good to know. It well, makes you feel better. There's know? a couple probably that don't, but you know what? Shame on them. But the majority of people are all about the region. And, and again, you know, it's not about our own wealth or our own success. It's about success overall and that we all can share within it together. Because I mean, there's so many wine palettes, my friend. Oh, my gosh. And there's so many great wines. Yeah. You know, we just make wines that we make. Well, amazing. So you talked about horse rides, horseback ride, which is pretty cool. So it sounds like you have a lot going on um, at the winery and in the inn. So outside of horseback riding, what other activities can people enjoy? Well, the hell, we got these crazy, my, my partner buys these, he bought two electric bikes, for God's sake. Oh my gosh. And they do about 22 miles an hour. They'll go 100 <laughs> miles if you pedal, but if you don't want to just cruise. So these, you get lunch, bottle of wine, and you take off on the bikes, and we're going to offer something. Wait, is that something that we're offering? Yeah, we're going to oh, offer right it. here. Oh my gosh! Wow, how'd that show up? I don't know. It seems <laughs> serendipitous. It's just like everything else that happens. But, but you know, what I'm finding is people are so enjoying these bikes because you're not going to—you can kill yourself or not because you can mix electric. <laughs> there's like four is that or five one of the options. Of the boxes yeah, that you can check. It, there's four or five places to stop and have the lunch and the bottle of wine. That's amazing. And uh, and enjoy the vineyard, a day in the vineyard. That's fantastic. Yeah. I was going to joke you should do like the the blue circles or the black diamonds for the bike. So they know which you know, we might have on. to start doing that. You'd be surprised what these people are doing. Get some jumps or something. But but that's a really amazing. And I think that not only are you using your property in the sense of creating the best fruit, understanding each specific parcel and how you can do that, but when you try to extrapolate hospitality, you know, I when I'm here, I look at a patch of grass. I'm like, we could do three-person event there you know um and so i'm sure throughout your property you've had many inspirations as, as such well you know we want people to come to wine country to cast and experience the vineyard and there's a lot of ways to do that of course you can power walk it you know you can do the bikes you can get on a horse you know and uh, my point being is it's about the land truly and it's a beautiful property and, and I love to hear you say that because even my explanation was hearing wind, hearing birds, and talking to my partner and my wife. And it was just, we were with the land. Yeah. Well, and I, I hope one day that I die in the middle of a vineyard with the bottle next to me, just enjoying peacefulness. But it was like I was uh, like halfway there. Well, you know brother, I mean? I'm like, going to die. That's <laughs> how I'm going to die. <laughs> my point, you know when, I'll hope to but my point being, guys, it. truly, it's about the vineyard and it's about being here. It's not what we're going to try to do is be invisible and take care of you. Absolutely. I Unless do. you want to go drinking with Wild Ted. Oh, Ow! wow. Bad Ted, Wild Ted. I'm bad Ted. Wild Ted's we got Because, you know, there is a thing called drinking. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. I do have to say, though, that there's two sides of the coin. One is kind of letting people alone, letting them just do their own thing. The other is that sense of recognition and outwardly displaying hospitality to the people who are staying with you. And I remember the night I was going in the morning because I had to do something in the office. 
had a tie-dye shirt on, some Niner shorts, looking real, real good. You know what I mean? <laughs> and I saw one of, um, I don't want to say one of the housekeepers, but one of your employees kind of coming out of the office and literally from across the way, basically shouted, kind of recognized who I was, recognized what I was going to go do, and was right there to help me out. And when I walked out, was asking me how my experience was and how everything was. And, you know, especially during these times, that personal connection also adds a lot. And so I believe there's also a little mini happy hour that you guys do, kind of get everyone together. Well, I mean, you know, what, I don't want to divulge too many secrets, but I'm just Well, saying. but no, but it's all about that. What we want to do, though, I, mean, I have a vision. Uh -oh. uh -oh. Another one? We brought a great chef in, and guys, this guy's incredible. What I'm going to, what we're going to do is you can get a package, stay at the inn. We're 10 miles out of town. We're going to create dinners that you can't buy in town. But also you got to put up with me or Steve hosting the dinner. So you know what? It's an experience but that you're not going to get anywhere. And that's the goal. That's the dream. And that's amazing. And, you know, this isn't one of the questions that we kind of talked about, but <clears throat> what is more valuable to a winery, someone who can speak on it or the wines itself? Because I think you have this delicate line of is it Rock and Ted or is it Cast Wines? And oh. how do you – do that balance in that line there's to no make balance. sure you there's yeah. oh, there's no balance there's, okay you know, well i was gonna say to respect everybody but, but go ahead no no there's no balance, no balance. you balance. know what it is, what is it? you gotta have good wine to play ah. if you don't have good wine you can't do anything huh? okay if you got good wine guess what you say whatever you well no you get them liquored up and we got them there you go there but you go if i said that that's sort of superficial but yes. my point being is truly the wine is everything what we're creating is an experience around that wine that gives people a lot of opportunity yeah. to, to really just experience themselves. Absolutely. And I think when you say liquid up, that means opportunity. opportunity well, I'm saying, yeah, I know. Yeah. Yeah. But Bad opportunity tip. to try and, try a lot of wines, opportunity to see what else is being offered, you know, exactly. and whatnot. We want people to come and let down what they're, what's on their, in their lives or on their minds and come and experience each other nice. and, and, and in the vineyard. Nice. And it's always back to the vineyard which as a winemaker, it should be. And I think it's important to have that proper respect to understand what is being created. And we're, he we're here as a facilitator, not as a controller. Yeah. And we're here to show the expression of the amazing place that you chose, of what varietals, how you want to grow those varietals, what other activities are happening on. I mean, it's, it's a winery almost doesn't happen overnight. It's years of development and years of understanding and progression. It's been 20 years, bro. That's it. And to think about it, I don't think there's a winery like us that has all this kind of opportunity. And I know a lot of them do, but Cass is unique. Would and you liken that to the area in which you are, the Geneseo district, or would you liken that to people like proprietors like yourself or the wines that you have? What do you think makes gives you that unique twang that a lot of other people can't do? Well, it's because Steve and I are crazy. Yeah, okay, by step, step one. Right and we just uh, decided very early that we want to create more of a environment to have fun or hospitality plus good wine. Yes. And good wine was always our starting point, but we wanted to create an experience. And we started that very early. That's amazing. You took my buzzword hospitality. As I was gonna say, you tried to hospitality and wine. So <laughs> well done, well done on yourself. Um, so what, um, I got one last question before we finish up, but what is your kind of, you know, it sounds like you're pushing the borders a lot. You're pushing, you know, doing the end. You're pushing doing different, you know, whether you're partnering with horse people or, or whether you're creating these electric bikes and doing that. What's next? I'm sure you got some more stuff. Actually, you know, bouncing around. You know, I want to. I want to like, say it real simply. I told my partner. I told my sleep. partner the other day. I go, dude, we're done. <laughs> I don't think. I don't believe. Now, that. what we're gonna that. do is we're gonna sit back and have some fun with this. Because you know, there was a. I want to maybe end this with with our mission statement. Sitting in Stalinbosch in 2003, not knowing all of what was gonna come. You know, I said, partner. Okay, are we willing to? produce the best wine off the vineyard because we're all a state. And he agreed with me. Good. The next one, if one of us does something or says something to hurt the brand, the other guy says something and the other guy listens. And I'll, he'll, he'll back me up. I, I, he, I've invoked it twice. And he listened. Wow. But the most important one is we're not going to do nothing that ain't fun. And that's what... The essence of Cass. I love it. I love it. But more than I love the essence of fun, how many times did he have to tell you that, no, we're not going to do well, that? Well, he didn't. I, he he him him no, I got him twice. He's not got me at all, baby. Oh, my God. <laughs>
Oh my gosh, Rocket Ted somehow <laughs> controlled the mind. Well, of you know, for the of rolling. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. Hey, gift of gab. It's a beautiful thing and can take you a lot of places. So, one of the last things that is a big thing for me, and I just kind of want to know, what is your favorite food or wine memory? It doesn't have to be from your time at Casper, say. It could be what your mama made you when you were two years old, but what is one of the things that sticks with you when you really go back to who the crux and the core, side of the crazy, outside of the bad, but Ted, what's the I, You know, and this might be more cliche, but it's not. I was in Lyon, mm -hmm. and it was at Bocouche. Mm. And I did a five-hour dinner, and I the most incredible wine experience dinner of my life. And this was in 2005. Wow. Was it the wine itself? Was the service? Was it, the, it was all the, the between food and, and the wine and how they reacted? I mean, what would what it was all encompassing that place with most phenomenal drank some of the most incredible Moved old mm. tempe. I mean, mm. it was it cost me like three thousand dollars, but, <laughs> but it was the best it. experience. I mean, truly, wow, wow, that's amazing. That got me really inspired about. And oftentimes to be quote unquote crazy or to have to obsessively focus about something like my wife as I do with my garden, my home, but you got to have that inspiration. You have to have that drive behind you and that, that thing that propels you forward. And it doesn't, sometimes it can happen naturally, but it's experiences like that that really, it's amazing to hear what resonates and what can inspire someone to do what they do. And a lot of, you know, what I love about France is, you get out of the city, it's it's farming, they're agriculture. They're, mm. they're probably the only country in the world that that really can be so self-sustainable yes. besides us. But so Cass, we have our own chickens. We have multiple gardens throughout the ranch. I raise all the beef on the ranch, but it took years for us to be able to have time to do all this. We're gonna get better at it because I want to, I want to have everything come on the ranch, especially with the pandemic. I'm, I'm gonna be more self-sustainable. The Megan, I'm never traveling again. <laughs> no, and that's and that's and that's amazing because I think it's important to kind of have that not necessarily reinnovation of self, yeah, but to reevaluate self and to understand because for example, I love doing spice blends. Well, I always hate it when I had to buy a spice blend. Why can't I make this myself? You know what I mean? Why can't I understand the nuts and bolts, that's how it's created, and actually take ownership and ability and you know, it may cost a little money in the in, in the beginning, but I've given myself not only knowledge, bought a lot of tools to do yeah. the job, but it's, it's you're more ready and, and I think matured in a sense to understand what you're actually dealing with and understand the work that goes into creating a simple product. Well, and, 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 and this has taught me more that we got the land and the wherewithal. And it's just work, it, but it's not work. I haven't worked a day in my life. This is the, our lives. Sounds like a day or two you've had a couple. Of, yeah, but you know what I mean? Yeah, we're going mean. to get more sustainable. And more where it, everything's on the ranch. That's amazing. And that's our dream. And that's amazing. Life. Well, thank you. You did a great job answering that question. So enough about you. Let's yeah. talk about my members. All right. I'm, I'm over all this sort thank of stuff. You, you know what thank I mean? You. I know. We're all. No, but we have thank you. Thank you for everyone who participated in our raffle. We have uh, two different gift certificates here. And I love the way you did this. Laminated and signed. I am not recreating this. I can't make a bunch of coffees. This is <laughs> this is the real I didn't deal. Think of it. I kind of want to bring it to the bank and just ask them how much I'm gonna get back for it. You know what I mean? But so uh, we are going to do our uh, raffle right now. So some of our members uh, were not only enthusiastic about um, understanding more about what we're going to be doing, not only wanted to follow along, but wanted support and helping our local communities. So what we did was there was a raffle where you buy a bottle, you get tickets. Good. Buy all three, you get a lot of tickets. Good. So I'm thinking right now. Hold on, we, hold on. Oh, you know what I'm going to do? Uh oh. I'm going to put a vintage Ted with this prize, and I'm going to put a rock and Ted with this prize. So we just we just kicked it up a notch. You did. I, I'm a little mad because I kind of want to. Yeah, no, no, no. I hey. I love this. And thank you, what? thank you, folks. <laughs> this is the example of what you're going to get. Hospitality is not in just giving bottles of wine, but it's about being thoughtful and understanding what people are going to interpret. So, say you uh, you already got a bottle of wine to go up there. It's a perfect for the drive up. You know what I mean? Something like that. So, it's called a roadie. A roadie. I like it. <laughs>
We don't provide the glasses. So, Mr. Rock and Ted, do you want to announce our first winner? I would love to. All right, are we doing electric bikes and picnic for two people, or are we doing includes a lunch, four lunch, lunch entrees? Hey, let's get these folks things. on some electric bikes. I like your yeah, style. I, would, I, I got my glass so I can see. Well, so you can see, they're prescriptive, so don't worry. Here we go. Let's look. Jeanette Esch. Jeanette Esch, thank you. Ow! Welcome. You will be enjoying an electric bike ride and picnic for two people, so... And have a little bit of rock and Ted, girl. <laughs> you're gonna have fun with it, trust me. Uh, oh yeah, actually, I thought you were talking about you, but you're talking about the one. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah, that's good. All right, do you want to do the second one as I, well? Would you mind? Yeah, okay, let's do it. My brother. Uh, we're doing lunch, four lunch entrees, including wine tasting. Kelly Fitz. Ooh, all right, Miss Fitz. Well, hey. rock and Ted is excited to see you. He's excited to give you a bottle of his vintage, vintage Ted. 2017 Ted. So you not only get Ted in the past, but you get them in the future. Yeah, I'm sorry, you got a lot of Ted coming. It's so bad. Just try to balance bad it out. Ted. You know what I mean? Um, Ted, I had a lot of fun with you here. I really appreciate you coming out. Uh, more than anything, yes, we get to talk about pro uh, your product. Yes, we get to try some amazing wines. But more than anything, it's about understanding the people who work within our community. To understand what our community is made up of. A lot of times, we have these humbling moments, and yet we search for something that's consistent or for something that can provide us hope. And it's really nice to know that not only do we have our friends in our local community, but also businesses and people who can help facilitate hospitable experiences. Yes. So I really want to thank you for that. And uh, we're excited to see what the future holds. Thank you, my friend. Hey, Absolutely. Right hey, there, one baby. more time. Ow! I want to try one more time. I got that. I got that high pitch. You know what I mean? There you so go. thank you, everybody. Bye. And thank until the next guys. time, thank uh, you. this has been another edition of Sipping Stories. There you go. And now we